Hey everybody. I wanna welcome you to the second weekend of the Spring Rites Literary Festival. Hey Mary, now while I'm talking, you can let people in or, or, or Leah. So I am Robin Schwartz. I am the program director and grant director of the Community Arts Partnership of Tompkins County. And the Spring Rites Literary Festival is one of our programs. We've got a bunch of public programs. We've got workshops, networking events for artists and all designed to bring local artists and audiences together. And we have grants for artists. A lot of my job is awarding uh, grants and running grant programs. So it's a fun job. Um, if you want to check out uh, the rest of the weekend and also eight writing workshops that are happening from December through March, uh, that's all at springwrites.org. I know you've been to the site because you registered for this event. If you wanna check out artspartner.org to see what else we do, I'm gonna put that link in the chat. I wanna do a little plug next weekend, starting on Friday and going through Saturday and Sunday is our annual Capapalooza Art Sale. And that is a fundraiser. And it's a collection of work that I've uh, been donated by community members. It is not, I don't ask artists for their own original work. I ask people to empty their closets and basements and attics. I end up with a lot of inherited art, a lot of art that people purchased on their travels, gifts, and it ends up being like this really cool, quirky, vintage collection of stuff that we sell for really, really, really cheap and um, made five to $6,000 a year for this important fundraiser. So that's on our website and I will put the link up. I wanna thank our Spring Rite sponsors. They are Ithaca College, Wegmans, M&T Bank, the Odyssey Bookstore and the Ithaca Marriott. And we also have funds from the New York State Council on the Arts and Poets and Writers. We would love it if you were able to donate to the Community Arts Partnership. This is a free event and I didn't even want to do a suggested donation because I, I knew that would just limit the audience, but we do need money. So if you could donate to the Community Arts Partnership, it's our annual fund, um, we need it. I will put the link up in the chat. Couple things, you are all on mute throughout the event. Oh, I, I think I forgot to do that. Um, you will be on mute throughout the event and we'd love you to use the chat function heavily. Um, comments, questions. Mary, I know, is going to do some stuff with you using the chat. So please, um, you can communicate with anyone on the call personally or communicate to everyone. And uh, that's how we're going to, that's how we're going to have fun with this call. So I am now going to turn the event over to Mary Larson. Thank you so much, Robin. And you guys, thanks for coming. Um, so I, Mary Larson, I've been the, the grateful recipient of, of a lot of support from the Community Arts Partnership. So um, I'm really happy that Robin found a way to make this happen. And I, um, if any of you have been to any of the other things I've gotten involved in, I, I like there to be sort of an exploratory or experimental uh, component to these things so that they're not just um, scripted and reading. So you'll see, um, in the chat, I've got a couple of little writing exercises. You don't, you don't have to, but if you want to, please feel free. Um, and then I'm gonna share my screen with an idea that I'd love for anybody to participate in while I'm doing a little bit of reading. So um, joining me tonight is uh, John Frankel and John and I are both writing, actually, I don't know what you're reading. Is it nonfiction, John, or is it fiction? Uh, nonfiction. Got um, it, okay. Travel Good. memoir, basically. Oh, excellent. Good. Um, so the idea, as you know, is on the idea of the word course, the concept of course, it has a lot of meanings that are interesting. And I asked you to put in there, if you mention um, which definition of the word course comes to mind uh, first for you. Um, I thought of this idea as an exploration and a rumination. Um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to explore free thoughts on this and for you to express your free thoughts on it, just for the heck of it. Um, I'm gonna work for a little bit first um, uh, on the idea of course as a, a shared understanding of course, right? Um, in the course of normal human events, things change. It's to be expected, there's a beginning, there's some progression of events or efforts and then some form of conclusion, things are different. In this course, you'll be required to explore this concept in a variety of its definitions. 
Um, so I'm going to, it's funny, I'm on Zoom all the time, but I never do this kind of creative stuff on it. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of poetry, a little bit of memoir, and then I'm gonna pass it over to John. Um, in advance of this event, I should mention too, uh, I did uh, send an email asking other collaborators to contribute sentences where they completed the sentence, of course, the, a sentence that began with, of course. Um, and I told people not to think about it, just spit and send. And so I have a bunch of those to read. So John, I, I meant to mention this to you. I'm gonna read my stuff and then I'm gonna go and read the spit and sends. And when I'm done, it'll be your turn. <laughs> okay. That's our plan. All right. Here goes, of course, to expect, to understand, of course, in anticipation. Expectation, because we know the connections between the parts. We have experienced them or at least observed them and assumption. We assume because we've observed the cause and effect, effort and progress. Monkey see, monkey do, repeat, produce. Repetition will kill you or engender expertise, engender expertise. 10,000 hours and you stop needing to think or even try much. You do and you do and it gets easier because you get better. Actually, which is it? You just do. It's in your body so you can leave your body and you don't even hear yourself sometimes. Muscle memory seems clever, but it's just monkey. The brain learning something is the best part for me. The brain wanders during repetition. Give me the discovery, exploration, being open, willingness. A coming song munches and scratches on the brain like a rodent in a wall, not visible, ever present, insistent, nagging, annoying, compelling, driving. What is it? Where now? It's right there. How to? What's the right way to get at it? Never straight, never direct, never like a crow. It can sit around in parts, detritus and disorder, but I trust because it's happened so many times before that if I sit in the mess, the just right piece will arrive, turning clutter into whole if I still care. And surprise is even part of the plan because nothing ever stays the same. Even the mountains are moving. Another definition of the word course that I've thought about a lot has to do with the course of um, treatment for something. You can take a course of antibiotics or um, some other therapy, a healing force to vanquish something that ails you. Wound, scab, scar, pardon me. Radiation, 1988. I wish I had taken pictures. They had me strapped to a big complicated chair in the middle of a huge freezing facility with multiple open means of egress, not unlike an airplane hangar, the Harvard Synchrotron, the only place on the East Coast where you could get this particular kind of radiation in 1988. I don't know what, if it was the type of radiation or the mode of delivery. If it happened now, I'd know what questions to ask. Anyway, this was where my pinpoint radiation took place. I'd walk down through multiple hallways and they'd strap me into the chair and they'd cover my head with the special mask they had made with the hole revealing the left eye, think Hannibal Lecter in a hole in a cage in the middle of the room. Then everyone would leave and I would be there alone and cold. Not for very long, it wasn't painful or even very frightening. The disease was what was so frightening. They administer and you receive cancer treatment in a day's submission and they know it and you know it. Hail Mary on both sides. I don't remember if it was loud, like an MRI, I think not. Interestingly, the only thing I remember clearly is being terribly confused. I think my sister Joni went with me once, my boyfriend another time. Six of these awkward treatments and I was done. I'd been prepared for this radiation with a surgery at Mass General where I just was, where I just was with Joni a couple months ago. Tiny rings of metal called tantalum had been sewn around the tumor, directing the radiation oncologist to show them where to point the radiation, the pinpoint radiation. This a revolutionary practice that would save my eye. The office was full of old people. The disease was uncommon in the young. The other patients I'd meet would assume I was bringing a parent or a grandparent. I guess we all got the rings so we could save our eyes. The rings were part of the process. They needed the rings to point the beam. And the mask, the making of it, the maker of the mask himself was interesting. His studio, lab, gallery, lodged deep in a warrant of workspaces in the lower levels of Mass General, the old Mass General. And the man toiling there seemed perfectly suited to his work. Christopher Lloyd-like, large, kind, odd, interested, meticulous. He made a plaster cast of my head and then cut a hole out. 
I'll look for the journal from them. They must have covered my hair in something, slathered Vaseline or something. I wish I remembered. There was a cast and some sitting, but I don't remember how long it took. And I remember that I kept that mask with the hole in the eye, kept it for a while. I don't remember throwing that out. I would very much like to find it. The rings, I still have. This 1988 radiation was successful, but we couldn't know then that it would be. We didn't know for a long time. What they knew, they knew that they could now point radiation at the tumor, just the tumor, and kill the cells in the tumor. And they also knew that since the tumor sat right in the center of my retina, the radiation would kill the center of the retina as well. Kill the site to save the eye, kill the melanoma to save the hemo. The site would not leave immediately, but over time, flaking away as the cells died. Did they ossify? Did they break down and join the bloodstream? More questions. It happened over time. It would require adjustment and observation and understanding this steady loss of vision on the left side. There were surprises and miscalculations in the coming years of observation. The medical side requiring frequent office visits with their attendant battery of blood work, photos, scans. And my own experiential data of distracting artifacts like blood vessels leaving brown viscous trails and forests of floaters, which persist today. I stumble and bump into things, add anxiety and I become clumsy. 18 years later in Ithaca, radiation had progressed considerably. The facility was brand new, immaculate, waterfall in the lobby, gleaming surfaces, tea and coffee set up, gracious employees. No more fluorescent overheads, no more airplane hanger, no more straps. I lie down on the modern platform of the machine with my shape already entered into its computer and I gaze at sunflower pictures on the ceiling. This time the tumor was reachable easily. The radiation would be directed through a range, thoroughly zap the lymph nodes, in case any mischievous creepers were lurking in the shadows. Little blue dots had been tattooed for Amy. For seven weeks, I'd go every day, Monday to Friday. I'd teach, pick up my kid at pre-K, head to the hospital. The receptionist would read to him. I'd get zapped, then we'd go home. Dr. Cho was a pleasant and friendly younger specialist, originally from Korea, who had studied with my oncologist from NYU and he liked her. She made us study poetry, he chuckled, before making a serious face again. He explained what they were going to do and why. He allowed that this was a lot and that I might develop leukemia from it in 30 years, but at least I'd be around and by then they'd know exactly what to do about that. The receptionist was a lovely woman about my age now, who had grandchildren and lived four doors down from my old house in Sheldrake. She was more than happy to read to my four-year-old. He liked her and he liked going to see Dr. Cho. That's what we said we were doing, going to see Dr. Cho. Inside my mind, I was losing. Inside, I was losing my mind with fear. Yeah but I did my best to make going to see Dr. Cho seem like a fun thing. When the seven weeks were over and 35 rounds of zapping made my skin red and implant hard like a basketball, there was one more surgery and then that course of therapy was considered complete. Regular testing and other more spiritual procedures have gotten us to this day. I'm gonna read that. Now I'm gonna read the of course, sentences that our friends sent us. And I'll name the people who gave them to us. Of course, my toaster is broken. Johnny Dowd. Of course, I'd like to have a word with the rooster nearby. Bronwyn Exter. Of course, it's harder, but hopefully it will still bring joy. Samuel Bagellan. Of course, the worst is yet to come, Karen Rodriguez. Of course, things will change for the better, of course. Of course, this darkness will lift and we will see the sun again. Even now, the sun shines, the leaves drop, the waves roll in. Catherine Westland. Of course, the mere presence of something yellow makes me feel better. It doesn't need to be the sun itself. That's me. Of course, and cause and other roughshod things that talk us into the mire and delight us, then leave with a squall, our year becalmed, gutted, blow and rage beneath a fresh wind, belly your fierce sail on, Scott Widow. Of course to be dressed and caressed is the thing, not loveless darlings left to perish ere they cherish, gone into black gowns in towns where loveliness is bereft of breath, in the carceral of fret, in the carceral of flesh, sorry, the 
The strange bend in death's finger winks to flirt. Come here, wash me in your eyes. Kiss me, take me when you leave me in the dirt. Should I? Uh... Yeah. John's gonna read. So uh, I'm gonna read from my memoir called Go While You Can. Um, and it's gonna get started here. Of course, <clears throat> everyone thought I was crazy when I went to Vietnam on March 10th for about a month. The COVID crisis had deepened daily, um, even hourly. But I was not going to give up my trip to Vietnam just because the worst pandemic in 100 years was spreading around the globe. If anything, uh, as I reasoned, it was a better time to go because there'd be fewer tourists and prices would be low. Even on March 9th, when I arrived in New York, I was pretty sure I would get my three weeks in. I knew it was coming, just not how fast. So I booked the ticket on January 1st. On January 2nd, the first cases were reported out of Wuhan. Weeks later, it became a news story and pretty much stayed there, sharing the front page with Trump's impeachment trial in the Senate and the Democratic primaries. I followed the story with the fascination of a dystopian novelist. COVID was, even in February, showing all of the signs of being the big one, and its approach was heralded by the implacable logic of geometric progression. 2019 was like one of the worst years of my life. And I, I am not going to go into the details. You would not really want to hear them and there's no time. But by December, I was in a rotten mood of self-pity and despair that I could not shake myself out of. I was 59 and pretty much a total shit to myself and everyone else. And, you know, I guess I needed some symbolic gesture that would restore a feeling of uh, freedom and youth, you know, a black sports car, an adulterous affair, massage school, opening a bar. But I did what I always do. I researched airfares. Travel is my safety valve. I love airports, planes, cabs, and hotels, being immersed in a place where no one speaks English. And the first airfare I researched was to Vietnam, a country I've always been obsessed with and which I have studied for 30 years but never been to. It cannot be easy to be married to me under any circumstances. This I realize. But by the end of December, I was intolerable. My wife Maya and I had had, my wife Maya had had enough and we had a big fight. And as we entered the resolution phase, you know, after 25 years of marriage, you enter the resolution phase. I said miserably, airfares to Vietnam are cheap. So go, she said. I was stunned. But we don't have the money. You've wanted to go your whole life. You're turning 60. Don't wait until you're 80. Go while you can. Go while you can. More loving words were never spoken. We had no idea that that would be the theme of the entire trip. From the moment I arrived at 9.30 p.m. in Saigon on March 11th, to when I returned to JFK on March 21st. I used it as the title of the travel memoir I wrote when I got home. And it is from that memoir that I'm reading today. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to tell you why I went to Vietnam in a little more detail. I was born in 1960. And until 1973 was certain I'd have to fight in Vietnam. Like many people, I watched TV news constantly in the 60s and was against the war. For the next 25 years, I read books about it. And like most Americans interested in the Vietnam War, my view was heavily politicized. I knew nothing about actual Vietnamese history, even of the 20th century. The country of Vietnam was just a curtain of napalm and murdered children to me, another way to be pissed off at my country. In 1991, I got a job shelving books in Olin Library at Cornell and was assigned the Wasson Eccles Collection, one of the largest and best academic library collections of Asian material in the world. I began to read serious academic works. It was a great moment in the scholarship of Southeast Asia, but there was not yet a single authoritative up-to-date history of Vietnam. That would not be published until the 2000s, 
and it was written by Keith Taylor. So I ground my way through historical monographs, obscure area studies, and journal articles. The more I read about Vietnam's colonial history and society, the more fascinated I became. I felt very, strong, very strongly then, as I do now, that Americans need to know the actual history of Vietnam because we spent 30 years financing and then fighting unwinnable wars that killed millions of people for no reason at all. Every American has a moral debt to know this history, even if the Vietnamese themselves don't seem to care if we do or don't. Young Vietnamese are future oriented and the older generation doesn't want to burden them with the pain, the anger, and the bitter memories of war. Part of the reason for that, of course, is, of course, they won the war. We are the ones wringing our hands about the ultimate meaning or meaninglessness of this event. We are the victim in America, because of course, in America, we are the victims of the Vietnam War. Mostly, the story of Vietnam history goes like this, or at least it did in the 90s. There were no differences between North and South. The Vietnamese were a unified people, separated by Cold War politics in 1956. They've been fighting wars of independence for a thousand years, first against China, then the French, and then the US. Vietnam is portrayed as the victim of other, more powerful countries' foreign policy and aggression. Their main characteristic is a fierce independence, and a strong sense of nation. But Vietnam has its own history and it had its own foreign policy. It fought wars of aggression with its neighbors, two peoples to the south, the Cham who occupied central Vietnam and the Khmer or Cambodians who occupied what we called South Vietnam for thousands of years. The Vietnamese were originally in the north. By the late 15th century, they started a serious push south. And by the late 17th century, they had reached Saigon, which at that time was a Khmer port. As the Vietnamese expanded south, they became a divided nation in the mid 16th century and would only be united in the late 18th century. And there were two governments, right? My plan was to fly to Saigon and tour the Mekong Delta and the Cham ruins south of Hue. By the time I re arrived, I realized many of the places I wanted to go were closed. I'm not a big planner when I travel, so I only planned my trip as far as a couple of hotels in Saigon and then the Mekong Delta town of Canto. <clears throat> the security lines at JFK were 50% of normal, maybe even less. No one was flying anywhere except for home. The flight to Narito, Tokyo was not full, Woman and I shared four middle seats, plenty of room to spread out. Tokyo to Saigon was empty. I had a row to myself and the passengers were almost all Asians. Flying into Saigon is spectacular. I, lo I love flying into cities at night. You know, there's nothing more exciting and, and, and Saigon was particularly so. I pressed my face against the window and watched the city approach, a river of light spangled and splashed as far as one can see. It had been over 24 hours since leaving New York, but my exhaustion vanished in a gust of adrenaline. I was finally in Vietnam. In no time, I was speeding by taxi to the Hotel Majestic, a 1920s Beaux-Arts colonial dinosaur located on the Saigon River. I checked in and practically ran to the rooftop lounge. It was an open terrace with a view of the river. There was a steady, hot breeze. I mean, this is March, right? So for an Ithacan, a steady hot breeze is, you know, beautiful. A Philippine lounge act was playing loud pop music. There were five other people besides me drowning their virus in booze and taking in the neon, the taillights and the river. I ordered a $6 beer and some meat rolls and took pictures, trying to read in the dim candlelight, distracted by the red lights of the boats, the blaze of traffic, and the lime and fuchsia signs on the sides of buildings. The band launched into a spirited rendition of My Way with more than a tiny bit of Sid Vicious mixed in with the Sinatra. The meat rolls were great, crispy and greasy, wrapped in lettuce with bean sprouts and cucumbers and a spicy nok cham for dipping. 
perhaps you can tell food is my consuming passion and a trip to Vietnam meant eating. I knew it would take a few days to find my legs and that only when I found my legs would I find the food I wanted. And Vietnam is a food obsessed nation. So I expected to eat well, often and cheaply. At six, I woke up and made my way to a different terrace for breakfast. The spread was pornographic. It started with Eastern Europe, raw vegetables and deli meats, rolls. Down the line were American, British and continental breakfasts, followed by congee, dumplings, fried fish, stewed pork belly, stir fried vegetables, soup and tropical fruit. I piled my plate up shamelessly from the Asian group like a 12 year old boy, reasoning that I had a big day ahead of me and needed nourishment, especially after all that airline glop. And then I tanked up on ice water and strong coffee. That day, I walked to the Vietnam History Museum, which is located next to the botanical gardens and a distressingly sad zoo. The air had the glorious smell of tropical Asia, the sudden stink of sewage, wafting wok high, incense burned in small altars set up on the ground in corners, diesel exhaust, fish. Benighted blocks of broken concrete and filthy facades led to oases of green foliage, banana and palm, flowering vines spilling over walls. Between blocks were alleys, doorways marked by bonsai trees and enormous ceramic pots. The traffic in Saigon is a marvel of balletic brinksmanship as 8 million motorbikes behave like schools of fish swarming over its streets and traffic circles. I've never been in a place with such chaotic traffic, a moving Mandelbrot set of vehicles with few, if any, stoplights or walk signs, though they do exist. At first, it seemed total madness. Motorbikes drove up and down the sidewalks when there were sidewalks. I soaked up the history I had only read about, lingered over and illegally photographed the lithe and sensuous charm sculptures. And after drinking a bottle of water in the gardens and a stroll that took me through the zoo, where like a time lord, I apologized to the tigers, elephants and crocodiles. Then I headed off for a bowl of pho on Louis Pasteur Street, a main thoroughfare loaded with places to eat from small street outfits commanded by squatting women with walks and a few pots to upscale gated palaces for the nouveau riche of this young and raucously joyful cheerfully vulgar capitalist city. Exhausted, I returned to the Majestic for a swim, a nap, and then a bite to eat, and then a bite to eat near the hotel, a nice second floor place that taught street kids how to speak English and work in the restaurant business. I had squid and sauteed, sauteed water spinach, an ubiquitous morning glory that runs rampant over the banks of canals and streams and eavesdropped on two young women. Vietnamese and Australian, who were in the throes of a crush. That's right, don't eat dinner next to a novelist. We are shameless foyers. The next day, I moved to the Wind Shack, a bamboo eco lodge. It is one of four, and the others are actual eco lodges, located down a quiet alley about a kilometer from the Majestic. The two places could not be more different, and I was looking forward to meeting other travelers, talking to people, getting out to the restaurants. After several days of solo travel, I was feeling a little lonely. I had lunch at a packed and frenetic place with a handful of tables and open pots of the most delicious food. Deciding what to get was hard, but I ordered stuffed squid, broken rice, and a vegetable soup. Sweating profusely, I slurped it down with joy in my heart, having found what I came looking for, a place without tourists. Then, I spent the day at the American War Remnants Museum, a museum that documents American war crimes. American war crimes. It is an unbearable reckoning with the evil of war. And I felt buried alive as I did in Berlin at the Holocaust Museum. So I went back to my third floor room and laid down under the clanking air conditioner to rest. At six, I decided to go to a highly recommended place, Benton Street Food Market, a few blocks away. It was a mob scene, 100% tourists. On the way, I passed a little place full of Vietnamese people 
and I began to wish I had simply stopped there and ordered a bowl of soup. At the entrance of the Benton Market was a large open space with picnic tables crammed with people. Inside was a cramped grid of vendors selling everything imaginable from Indian snacks to pizza and pasta, saute and fried meat rolls, barbecued and roasted meat, whole ducks, racks of pork ribs, soy sauce chickens, and cuttlefish hung from hooks. There were live fish tanks, fresh oysters grilling over fire, dried squid, Thai food, noodle and pancake makers, and all the usual street food, as well as beer, bubble tea, coffee, and a live band. The prices were ridiculously high. I made my way through it twice, trying to avoid eye contact with the aggressive vendors. It was a cattle call for hungry humans. We shuffled through the narrow stockade-like aisles. It was so unpleasant, all I wanted to do was escape. And it didn't occur to me that this was a dangerous level of crowding in a time of pandemic, even as I bumped into the lethargic overfed people, none of whom wore masks, myself included. And by the way, the Vietnamese wore masks. <clears throat> I escaped as quickly as possible and went back the way I had come to find the restaurant I had passed. Two gregarious parties were camped out around tables on the sidewalk. And in the fluorescent lit interior, there was a party of men drinking beer and slowly making their way through the bowls and dishes covering their table. It was not a cheap restaurant. Dinner cost around 12 bucks, including two beers, sauteed water spinach with garlic, crab fried rice, and spicy pork on the bone with fresh bean sprouts and greens. <laughs> it was delicious. Uh, just, you know, it was food heaven. Gravid, lips buzzing with pleasure. I put down Bleak House, ordered a second beer, and watched people eat and the waiters work. Watching the floor of a restaurant when you've been a waiter and a bartender is always entertaining. I had a fantasy that I could hang out with one of the big parties, but they were all Vietnamese and probably didn't speak English. As I walked out onto the sidewalk to leave, a guy with an Australian accent asked in an extremely sarcastic voice, and I am not going to do an Australian accent, and I'm not even gonna do his extremely sarcastic voice because I can't do it justice, but I assume you can imagine what a sarcastic Australian sounds like on a hot night in Saigon. Why are you reading the Bible? He asked. I had my little red leather bound edition of Bleak House. And I'm an American, so as funny as I might find the Bible, I'm not used to laughing at it in public unless I'm just with my friends. I turned around and said, it's Dickens. Is there something wrong with Dickens? Laughter erupted out of him. The Australian guy was sitting with a group of Vietnamese women and men. They were speaking English and the guy, Matt, asked where I was from. And as usual, I told them I was from New York because Ithaca is too complicated to explain. Matt was an English teacher and the other people were his students, a middle-aged heavy man with a robust pitted alcoholic nose and warm boozy smile who looked like a Tammany Hall mayor. Fawn and Lillian to my left, event planners who worked for the mayor and to the right next to Matt Hahn, a wedding planner with dyed blonde hair in a halter top and skin tight shorts that barely touched her thighs. Dishes covered the table and bottles of Corona beer they tipped into glasses. Waiters fussed over us constantly, bringing more beer and large, uh, large ice cubes to keep it cool. They removed the finished dishes and put a clay pot down in the center of, in the, center of the table with a whole crab steamed over black noodles. The mayor insisted that I have some. I was stuffed. I felt like Mr. Creosote from the meaning of life, but I wanted to be polite and more. I wanted a taste of that crab, but it was just too much. I picked up chopsticks and ate a few mouthfuls of squiggly black noodles, chewy, rich and unctuous, redolent of the essence of crab. I asked Matt if I could buy a round and Matt told me that the mayor who was vibrantly, buoyantly drunk was worth millions of dollars. He was the biggest event planner in the country and represent, represented Vietnam's elite pop stars. He was also part owner of the restaurant. The mayor smiled, held up a bottle of Corona 
and toasted, Corona! Corona! We all yelled, clinking our bottles. The mayor said in a thick accent I had to decode, I was in New York this year. My hotel was on Broadway. Do you know Broadway? Book of Mormon, Hamilton, Lion King, Aladdin? You like musicals, I asked. Hey, hey, musicals! He thrust his corona up like the Statue of Liberty torch and our bottles crashed together as everyone cheered, Corona! The mayor and I continued to shout at each other across the table, but everything we said was drowned in cross conversation. So I just laughed when he laughed and toasted the coronavirus when he did. Han was crawling all over Matt, sitting in his lap, teasing him in a mix of Vietnamese and English, which she spoke ferociously, oblivious to pronunciation, grammar, and syntax, mocking Matt's frequent corrections. She ripped off pieces of crab and cracked the shells with her teeth, sucking the meat out and spitting the shells on the sidewalk. She's got a lot of energy, I said. You should meet her mother, Matt said. And then he told me about her family, and then announced, I taught them the word cunt today. Cunt, I said? If you say bloody cunt in Australia or England, no one cares. But in America, Matt says, it means pussy. We were talking about that. They don't like the word. The word cunt ricochets around the table. Everyone agrees it is an extremely offensive word, but that doesn't stop them from saying it at every opportunity and bursting into laughter each time. Cunt, 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 clink the glasses, laugh, toast to cunt. Han belched. It was like a crack of thunder and they erupted in laughter. I mentioned to Matt that on the way out of my hotel, I overheard the staff hanging out in the kitchen and some let out, someone let out a really loud fart and they laughed like 12 year old boys. Oh yeah. They think farting is the funniest thing in the world, he said, but they won't pick their teeth in public. He mimicked the way I had seen people use toothpicks, covering the mouth with their hands. Well, what about Vietnamese women, he asked. What do you know about Vietnamese women, he eyed Han. Several times, Matt had told me she was Communist Party royalty. She could do what she wanted. And I read that women were expected to be modest in Vietnam, but it seemed that many women of the city pretty much said, fuck you to that. I'd seen a lot of women dressed for the beach, pull up on motorbikes, take off their helmets and shake out their hair. I understood that Matt wanted to embarrass me. He was nudging and winking. I ransacked my brain for response that wouldn't offend anyone and pulled out, I know about the Trong sisters. The Trong sisters, he shouts. You really do know about Vietnam. The Trong sisters, Trung Truc and Trung Ni, are among the brightest stars in the Vietnamese pantheon, <clears throat> and the brightest in the historical firmament of rebels. Beginning in 29 AD, 29 AD, they led a rebellion against the Chinese governor, Su Ting, a corrupt official who opened his eyes to money, but closed them when it came time to punish rebels. He feared to go out and track them, trap them. Trung Trok was the daughter of the local gentry known as the Lock Lords, married to Tri Sak, an obstreperous aristocrat whom Su Ting tried to control with lawsuits. I'm just going to read. Uh, there we go. That's much better. Sorry about that. By the spring, she urged him to fight back and organize the other Lock Lords. By the spring of 40 AD, they had overrun the Chinese settlements and made her their queen. She abolished the hated Chinese taxes and restored the tradition of gift exchange. Apparently later Vietnamese historians tried to say that she was actually serving her husband um, or that he had been murdered and she was out for revenge, but the Chinese histories are clear. She was the leader. The Trung sisters are folk heroines as important as the emperor Li Loi a peasant general who led the rebellion against the Ming in the early 15th century, and the Taishan brothers, the late 18th century revolutionaries who united North and South for the first time. At the same time, the French were having their revolution and we were having ours. How about Madame Nu, Matt asked. Madame Nu is one of the notorious assholes of the Vietnam War, wife to President Diem's brother. Oh yeah, Madame Nu, I said. 
Her husband executed the Viet Cong prisoner, that famous picture. That was someone else, Matt said. Well, I thought it was him. I got the story confused. The man I meant was Wing Nyok Lone, a general in chief of the South Vietnamese police, as well as head of its central intelligence agency. During the Tet Offensive, he was photographed and filmed executing a prisoner on the street, one of the most iconic images from the war, like the naked girl flaying a napalm attack. I have always been struck that a man of such power would be out on the street shooting people in the head. Well, I continued, hoping to regain my stature. She was the one who said the Buddhists were having some barbecues. Madame Nu said this after Buddhist monks protesting the Xiem regime set themselves on fire. The table laughed. Han said, yes, some barbecues, that's her. A guy rode by on a bicycle with a giant thing of toilet paper balanced on the bars. He should take that to America. He'd make a fortune, I said. Matt said, you don't need toilet paper here. The Vietnamese have their butt hoses. The butt hose is one of many gifts the civilizing French left behind. In fancier places, there's an actual bidet, but every toilet in the country from the meanest to the most princely has some means of shooting water on your ass to clean it. In most cases, it is the hose that we use on our kitchen sinks attached to the floor next to the toilet. They were saying something in Vietnamese and laughing. Matt interrupted and said, English only. Han laughed even harder and said, Lillian says our friend Due hoards condoms. Lillian chuckled and held up her hands, wiggling her fingers. He puts them on his fingers to open elevators, Han shrieked. Matt started to make fun of various English accents. I mocked the Australian accent pretty brutally. I'm trying to teach them an American accent. Can you help me out, he asked. I became the center of attention again. Han said, do California. Yeah, we want to hear California accent. Matt was laughing. I mean, they didn't know one American accent from another, but I was hard pressed to figure out how to speak like a Californian. Maybe they meant Valley Girl speech. I mean, I can do New York accents okay, and I'm fluent in Scorsese. I tried, said a few things in Valley Girl, which they liked, and then ran through some bad Southern and decent New York accents. Matt said like a camp counselor, okay, time for T and TH. Everybody, Han, what's this? He held up three fingers, tree fingers. No, no, not tree, th, th, th. His tongue obscenely pushed between his teeth to demonstrate how the hardest digraph in the, in, in the language for non-native speakers is pronounced. He interrogated each person at the table, drilling them mercilessly, mocking their pronunciation, mocking them as human beings, all the while laughing good-naturedly. Lily and I started to talk seriously. We talked about the Mekong Delta and pollution. She was quiet. She explained that she was from Pleiku in the Central Highlands and that she would go home soon because of the virus. Everyone was going home. The question in America for the past four years has been, should I stay or should I go? The last time large numbers of Americans asked themselves this question was during the Vietnam War. With COVID in Vietnam, it was the question every traveler asked, myself included. I stayed until the last day possible and returned to a ghost town. JFK was empty. Maya picked me up and she didn't hit the brakes from the moment we left the parking lot until we stopped for gas in Pennsylvania. And I'm just gonna read when Mary first contacted me about doing this, I sent her a very short prose poem. I didn't use it, it turns out, but I think I'll end with it. You know, she already read it. Of course, to be dressed and caressed is the thing, not loveless darlings left to perish ere they cherish, gone into black gowns in towns where loveless loveliness is bereft of breath. In the carceral of the flesh, the strange bend in death's finger works to flirt. Quote, I say, come here, wash me in your eyes, kiss me, take me when you leave me in the dirt. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. That was fabulous. I enjoyed it so much. I would like to go to Vietnam. Um, that's awesome. Um, it's, it's, we've gotten a few things in the chat. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if everybody participating has been taking a look, but we've got uh, some some good stuff. Um, 
I don't know whether you want me to read them out loud or if that makes sense. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you just this exercise that I uh, played with while I was preparing things uh, for this. And, uh, and then while uh, you can you know, enjoy it if you want to, and uh, you can do it if you want to. And, um, and I'll try to finish. I have to finish my seven, definitely. So let me share my screen. Can you see this? It's, look at the word table. You see this thing here? Here, I can make it bigger. That. So I sort of, um, I made a, a trajectory of a, a course poem you could experiment with. I did one on a migraine. I don't know why all my stuff is about health. Um, so you can try one or, or not, or try one of your own. And uh, while you uh, observe that, I'm just gonna read you this shorter bit on uh, a course you take. Philosophy 101, Facts and Fictions. This was written by someone named Mary Lorson uh, in November of 1980. 18 year old me wrote this. I think I'll quit drinking for a while. When I drink, I feel and think things I don't when I'm sober. On November 19th, she wrote, I took or rather went to the Facts and Fictions final today. For some reason, it's really been important to me to impress or win the approval of Mr. Thiesmeyer. So I've tried hard and done well on the papers, but. When I got to the final, I just couldn't do it. I really didn't care about my exam grade. It, to me, really was no indication of the things I've gotten out of the course, which have been numerous and valuable to me. I just didn't do the exam. I just started writing. I didn't care what I got for a grade, but I did want Mr. Thiesmeyer to know that I learned a lot and I really appreciated the course and his guidance. It sounds weird, I know, but to me, it made and makes perfect sense. I'm not sorry. As I was leading the exam, Mr. Thiesmeyer asked me if I picked up my last three papers and told me that I'd done very well on them. I went and got them, two A's and an A minus. That really makes me happy. I worked hard and did well. Isn't that really what's important? Right now on my last night here, I'm sort of bumming out. I'm really going to Miss Gale and she was even feeling a little sentimental about Becky. Oh no, I was even feeling a little sentimental about Becky even though she's been so weird and unfriendly. That was my roommate. I have not changed anything here. Two days later, at 11, on 11.21 of 80, Mary Lorson wrote, I'm at Hamilton now. I've said goodbye to William Smith for now or forever, I don't know. I stopped by to see Mr. Thiesmeyer to apologize, thank him and say goodbye. He should have slashed me for not taking the exam, but he's given me three options after having spoken to the William Smith Dean and getting her approval, which are too, which is, which are too generous and listed in the letter I'll keep in this book, but I will say I can't find it. I haven't decided whether I'll choose one of Mr. T's options because I don't deserve them. I could have taken that exam. I could have passed it, but I didn't. Everyone else went in and took it like they were supposed to, and it's not really fair that I get this special privilege, but I'm sure Mr. T went to a lot of trouble to get it for me, so I'm going to make a decision. I already miss Gail and Evelyn and North. Right now, I feel for them the same way I did toward my high school friends when I left for college, that I'd meet other people, but that they would be my real friends. Now I'm not even psyched to see my high school class reunited. I really don't care about most of them now. It will be great to see some people, though, like Jessica and George Vasquez, and Lauren and Peter Griffiths, and of course, Mike Weiss. Right, the, of course you teach. This is short, I'll just go quickly. Of course you teach. You will learn this. You will create this. You will deliver this. You will collaborate with this person. You will combat with that. You will discover this. You will reject that. You will embrace me. I will be gone. And another course will begin. Pass and fail and do it again a little bit differently next time. I didn't right away understand. Teaching English for Dummies, that's an actual title and I actually bought it on the slide. It didn't seem to apply. I just figured it out day by day. The first five days, first five years of teaching are hell, Joni said. Don't smile till Christmas. Yeah, right. For DJs and teachers, dead air is a killer. A new teacher is chum for unhappy teen sharks. I survived. I invested extra attention in the girls who were mean to me and why? Because I got it. I saw myself and they didn't hurt me. I think that one or two figured it out later. It doesn't matter either way. I feel it felt like service. I learned every single day and that was a gift. At one point I realized that some kids would never ask a question and that the ones who were confident enough to ask them were healthier in every way. But, and you will learn that you are not allowed to stop learning. You will learn that you are anyway stopping and not stopping. You will learn that if you don't pay attention, you will learn that bad habits are easy to pursue, that they're pursuing you. 
not calling, not answering, just doing the minimum. Where's the money in that? In the keeping of the juices flowing, you need to learn this. Patience, volume, not just the minimum. In French, it's fairly cool, do the shopping, make the rounds, to touch on each part of a living pattern. The interaction of living things with patterns, some planned, some created, some developed as part of natural action. Course of a career, a life, childhood, time spent doing one thing as opposed to another, like a memoir about XX, about that guy, you know. Course has to do with movement, change, planned and observed, reflection that allows for reorientation, adjustment, to observe and adjust is the curriculum. And that's all I've got. Um, let's check the chat and see if there's more from you guys. I think I have to stop sharing this one. Bunch of comments in chat. Great, John, you wanna read them? Well, you should, but I will. <laughs> so you should make a weekend together. <laughs> so, let's see. Pride preceded yeah. the fall. Anyway, um, uh, of course, you're going to have some of my, should we start just at the beginning? Uh, yeah, go for it. I know everything. I know it all. Of course, of course, course, course is a way. Of course, riffing on course is creating, of course, in a in a oppositional sense, is the opposite of change. It's being stuck, certainly. Certainty. Of course, you can have some of my potato chips. <laughs> and then Ruth, uh, should I say the names? I'll just say the comments. Of course yeah. I will participate. Of course, I don't know what the meaning of life is. <laughs> I do, I'll tell you later. Family is not on earth, of course. They have all ascended with my bloodline. The Trung sisters, I'm here for this. Of course, I'm getting <laughs> hungry. Of course, I'll skip those. That was a compliment. Of course, of course, John's, right, of course prose John's prose was beautiful. <laughs> and then Ruth again said, of course, novelists watch the parade of being, habit, dress, and hidden intentions in their reach. Of course, the watched are not watching, strictly inhaling their own human odors, blooming and withering, rooted, the novelist observes. And then Community Arts Partnership wants to remind everyone that we would dearly love if you could donate and support the festival and the Community Arts Partnership. Any amount is great. And there's a, a link and I really will be sending them something. Yes. And I wish and hope everyone will because this is a great event and, a, and you know, I, I'm just amazed they pulled this Rider Festival out in November all of a sudden. And then thank you, Mary, you were wonderful. Oh, my pleasure. And Robin, thank you. Thank uh, you guys. Yes, Robin. That was great. I also, I also, um, John, uh, my husband went off on a six month trip uh, with my sincere blessing, you know, <laughs> yeah. he, he was, you know, he's like in his seventies. I'm like, go have your adventure, man. Yeah. And I get to have the house to myself. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, I think we learn tools in a long marriage. for keeping Right, it right, right, right. <laughs> Well, we have another event starting in four minutes, everybody, but uh, does anyone have any questions for, for Mary or John or any other comments? Nope. That was really fun, Mary. I how, did you, how did you think, did you say at the beginning of your event how you thought of this theme? It just kind of developed. It was just one of those things. Sometimes I'll pick a word and I'll just sort of nod it for a while and turn it over and this was one. Um, and so I just thought it would be fun. <laughs> yeah. I miss the classroom. So <laughs> it's good for people to talk about something. Tell people a little bit about all the things that you do artistically. Me? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, <laughs> I like, <laughs> I make music and I like to write stuff and I sometimes write music and I sometimes write other things as well. He's a singer, <laughs> songwriter, producer. You've done film. You've done plays. Yeah. You've done writing. You're you do everything. Playwright. I try everything. everything. Let's say that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I try everything. <laughs> um, I think we have some new messages. One sec. Of course, I'm getting hungry. Someone said oh, we have some. Today. <laughs> and um, of course, good to be with you all. Said Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. And um, yeah. 
Yeah. I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. And, uh, yeah. So before we start the next event, um, I want to, again, invite people who just came on uh, to check out our website, which is artspartner.org, and I will put it in the, uh, in the chat. We have two more days of spring writes. We have eight free writing workshops that I've spread out uh, through December. You know, in previous years, the Spring Writes Literary Festival was 45 events over three days, all piled up against each other. And people had to choose, um, oops, I'm accidentally sharing. Who's sharing my screen? <laughs> you are doing it. Put the share screen up. Uh, Mary was checking out our website, just as I asked. Um, and, and you know, it, why was I doing events against each other? I mean, we we're already splitting up a pretty small audience. And now we're doing events one at a time because we have to, because I can only be on one Zoom call at a time. And we have three times as many people joining the calls. And we talked earlier about, you know, how much fun it is to, to watch events from home and, uh, and not have to leave the house. So it's, uh, it's definitely been working out for spring, right? So I encourage you to look at, um, there's an event right after this. Um, I think I'm gonna start, Leah, my, uh, my welcome speech for the next event. Thank you, Mary and John. Thank you. It was really fun. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for attending.